Victory starts in our mind. When your vision is limited, your life will be limited. It's amazing what happens when you enlarge your vision, when you believe big, when you pray bold prayers, when you dream great dreams. Too often, because of disappointments, delays, things that haven't worked out, we've watered down our dreams. We've lowered our expectations. We're not stretching, believing for great things, believing to get well. Are you putting limits on what God wants to do in your life? Are you focused on what you think can happen only in your ability? Your existence is constantly an engagement with the universe, but your mind becomes against the universe. If you create a psychological condition that you're against or you're in competition with the universe or the cosmos, obviously you will feel crushed for small things. Your default mode is to say, I'm an imposter, I'm a loser, I'm not likable, nobody likes me, I'm not lovable. It has become part of your default mode network. And it's super important for you to realize that just like I could go from being a right-hander and teach myself how to be a left-hander, it is the exact same process for you to go from somebody who defaults to thinking negative garbage to becoming somebody who thinks directly. And just like learning to go from writing with your right hand to teaching yourself to write with your left hand, it is going to be a process, not an event. It is going to require you to switch out of the mode where you automatically grab the pen with your right hand and you direct your thoughts to deliberately grab this pen with your left hand. Things are going well, you're happy. When things are not going well, you're sad. But when you learn how to self-regulate and create more coherence in your brain and heart, then you're no longer dependent on your outer world controlling your mood. When you're inspired by something or someone in your life, you feel the magic. Now's the time to be the magic. What are you going to do? Are you going to let the masters inspire you to feel it? Or are you going to strive to be a master? It's your choice. The magic is waiting. Not only for you just to feel it, but to be it. Nobody can take this away. The first step is getting completely and brutally honest enough to say, I am tired of myself. When you say I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, that's the facilitator of change. That's when you're ready to say these words, no more excuses. No more excuses. You know that you have an image of yourself inside. When you stand in front of a mirror, you see a reflection of the physical you. But that's not the real you. You have a picture of yourself in your mind. You know, Dr. Maxwell Maltz wrote a book back around 1960. It was called self-image psychology, psycho-cybernetics. It's a phenomenal book. He said it was the greatest discovery of his generation. He was a cosmetic or a reconstructive surgeon, and he found he would do work on people. He might have been a nose job or removed a terrible scar. And he noticed that when he did that, there was a phenomenal change in their personality. But he noticed with others, he would make a phenomenal physical change and there was no change in their personality. And that led him to postulate that we have two images. We have the one that's coming back from the mirror, but we've got an inner image. And that inner self image is literally controlling our life. You will find people that have a very poor self image or low self esteem. They won't look you straight in the eye. They're afraid to shake hands with you. They're very shy and withdrawn. They go through life hiding from life. They don't like themselves. They don't know themselves. Do you know when a person improves their self-image, they change their entire life. Their income changes, their relationship changes, their health changes. Do you know how you do that? Start studying you. Start to find out more about you. There's something phenomenal about you. Do you know when I began to study this material 57 years ago, I had very poor self-image. I had low self-esteem. I took dumb jobs. I never earned any money. I never had fun. I had poor relationships. 
And as I started to study, started to study real solid information, everything in my life started to improve. I've got friends all over the world here. I earn millions of dollars. I'm in my 80s and I get as much energy as a person in their 30s. You see, when you start to understand really who you are, you're God's highest form of creation. There's things about you that just about blow your mind as you start to study and really understand them. You'll walk a little taller. You'll stand a little straighter. You know something? You'll enjoy a whole lot more of life. The moment you think you're the most important person in every room that you're in, the moment that your ego screams more loudly than your hunger to grow and represent mastery is the beginning of your descent into obsolescence and irrelevance. You are only as good as your last performance. I remember reading about one of the icons from Hollywood and he said it. He said, I'm only as good as my last picture. It's so easy to sort of hang your hat on something you did a year ago or five years ago or 10 years ago. Maybe, you know, the great musicians, they all have that in common. It's not like, oh, I did this album 40 years ago and I'm sort of still dining out on that great masterpiece. The great ones, the people of great influence, the people of great creativity, they understand that you're only as great as your last performance. The elite athletes I've mentored, this is how they see it. They say, last year's championship performance is this year's starting point. So look, we all want to be satisfied. We all want to be happy. We all want to wake up every day and go through life feeling a sense of joy. But there is a great danger in being completely satisfied. When I work with the billionaires and the titans of industry and the Hollywood superstars, here's what I notice: They're never satisfied. Now, sometimes if you don't manage that unsatisfaction, you're gonna be a very unhappy person. I'm just reporting on reality. A lot of the true titans, it's never enough. They are always dissatisfied. They always wanna work their craft better. They always wanna have more influence. They always wanna have greater impact. They always wanna grow their movement. So just remember that first element of this deconstruction. Satisfaction breeds stagnation. You want to be joyful and, gr and grateful, and yet at the same time, you never want to lose the fire in your belly to be better, to materialize more for your primal genius, to offer value to more people, and to grow the very thing that you do. So worrying about whether something will or will not happen is not only completely futile, and what is now being discovered by science, actually adds fuel and power to that thought, making it potentially more likely to occur. Not all of your thoughts have the capacity to change your world. Only the habitual ones are those that are fueled by emotional intensity. Most people meander through life, ending up in a career because of chance, not choice, and are not that passionate about anything. Therefore, they fail to engage this force in any way other than stressing about their credit card bill. It is the addition of emotion to thoughts that give them their power. How that happens, we don't really know yet. Although how the brain deals with emotions may hold a clue, for a long time it was assumed that emotions arrived out of thought. It was believed that when sensory signals reached the brain's translator, the thalamus, they were then interpreted and sent to the correct department. The signal would travel to the thinking bit, the neocortex, and then onto the feeling bit, the limbic system, where it would initiate an appropriate response. Joseph Ledeau, a neuroscientist at the Center of Neural Science at New York University, was the first to discover that this wasn't the case. There are two little almond-shaped structures called the amygdala perched above the brainstem on either side of the brain. They control emotion. Ledeau's research proved that when signals from the senses reached the thalamus, two signals were sent out not one. The first traveled across a single synapse to the amygdala and the second signal was routed to the neocortex for conscious assessment. The result is that the amygdala hijacks thinking and has you springing into action before you are fully aware of what's going on. It is this reflex that will cause you to jump in a river to save a child before your thinking brain has even registered the danger. It's also why an emotional outburst often arises before the brain's engaged. Unfortunately, 
This discovery illustrates the fact that emotion has direct and powerful access to the subconscious mind. It triggers action faster than logical thought alone, and therefore may be partly responsible for why emotion is such a potent and essential ingredient in turning thought into reality. The more intensely we feel about an idea or a goal, the more assuredly the idea, buried deep in our subconscious, will direct us along the path to its fulfillment.